그럼 이제 AI 서밋 2018을 시작하겠습니다. AI 서밋 기획자 박세정 대표를 무대로 모시겠습니다. 모두 큰 박수 부탁드립니다. 네, 안녕하십니까? 안녕하세요. 네, 어, 타이머 돌려주시고요. 예, 여러분 반갑습니다. 어, 오늘 어, 약 300명 정도 새로 오시기 때문에 제가 어제 했던 소개를 잠깐 다시 드리도록 하겠습니다. 어, 저는 행사 기획자 박세정 대표라고요. 어, 마케팅 쪽에서는 제 이름이 좀 알려져 있을 텐데 AI에서는 아마 낯설 겁니다. 저 사람은 누구지 하는 생각이 할 텐데요. 어, 저는 이제 대기업 생활을 오랫동안 하고 어, 지금은 지식 그 컨퍼런스 몇 개를 이렇게 운영하고 있습니다. 어, 그리고 어, 이 행사를 어, 준비함에 있어서 이제 여러분들이 많이 도와주셨어요. 지금 이제 SBS에서 오신 분이 계신 분이 있는데 <웃음> 그 SBS, CNBC 인공지능 신문 어, 미디어로서 이제 저희랑 같이 준비를 했고요. 많이 도와주셨습니다. 그리고 스판스 기업들도 있는데 밖에 또 부스도 있고 어, 탁월한 선택을 해주셨고요. 그리고 저와 같이 몇 달간 어, 스텝 어, 그리고 자원봉사자 여러분 어, 준비하시는 데 있어서 도와주셔서 감사드립니다. 그리고 어제도 한 20분 정도 발표를 했고요. 오늘 또한약 20분 정도 강의를 할 텐데 국가별로 참 다양하게 많이 왔습니다. 한국을 비롯해서 미국, 중국, 싱가포르 오늘 또 호주에서 오신 분, 캐나다에서 오신 분 이렇게 여러 국가에서 와주셔서 감사드립니다. 사실 이 AI 행사가 이 정도 규모로는 한국에서 많지가 않죠. 그래서 이제 이렇게 사실 이첫 해거든요. 이 행사는 여러분들이 내년에 하길 바란다면 혹시 하길 바라세요? 아, 별로 답이 없군요. <웃음> 올해가 마지막인가요? 아, 계속 열심히 연구해서 아, 또 세계적인 아, 여러분들 도움이 되는 연사들이 올수 있도록 노력하도록 하겠습니다. 아, 참가자 구성에 대해서 잠깐 설명해 드리겠습니다. 참가자는 약 340개 국내의 기업 아, 연구소 단체에서 오셨는데요. 특히 이번에는 연구소에서 꽤 많이 오셨습니다. 어, 연구원분들이 꽤한 100, 100여 분 이상 오시지 않나 생각이 듭니다. 아무래도 이제 AI의 관련성 때문이겠죠. 그리고 어, 산업별로는 거의 10개 이상의 산업에서 오셨는데요. 저기에 보시는 브랜드는 일반 기업을 의미합니다. 일반 기업에서 참 많이 오셨습니다. 그리고 참석자는 구성이 이제 경영자도 계시고 어, 매니저 레벨, 그 다음에 부장님, 그 다음에 여기 이제 과장님, 연구원분들, 책임 연구원분들 꽤 많이 오셨고요. 저희가 이, 그 아무래도 비즈니스 컨퍼런스다 보니까 학생들에게는 광고를 하지 않습니다. 그래서 저희는 이제 30세 이하로는 타겟을 하지 않기 때문에 거의 홍보를 잘 하진 않았기 때문에 어, 가급적이면 실무자 이성이 이제 참가하기를 원했고 아마 대부분 다 그렇게 된 걸로 알고 있습니다. 이 행사 기획 의도입니다. 어, 이 행사 기획 의도는 어, 바로 이게 이제 키워드인데요. AI는 어, 테크놀로지가 아니다. 그리고 이거는 긴 여정 중에 하나다. 지금도 이제 그긴 여정 중에 하나 있는데요. 테크놀로지입니다. AI는. 인데 테크놀로지가 어떤 비즈니스와 융합을 하지 않고 가치를 만들어내지 못하면 그걸 끝나버립니다. 그거는 우리가 과거에도 많이 봤습니다. 그래서 AI가 지금 그 융합의 딱그 시작점이 와 있는 것 같아요. 제가 또 참고한 책은 어, 제가 번역 감수를 하고 있는 이 책이고 내년에 나올 것으로 보이고 여러분들이 많이 사줄 것이라 <웃음> 생각합니다만 어, 여기에 이 단어가 있습니다. 그 위대한 그 적용, 적용의 적용 시대에 우리는 도입, 도입해 있다. 수많은 이제 스타트업과 플랫폼 기업들, 대기업들이 AI에 어, 투자를 하고 있고 또 많은 사례를 이제 만들고 있습니다. 그래서 연구소보다는 어쩌면은 학계보다는 어쩌면 이런 그 많은 그 기업들, 프로젝트들을 통해서 AI가 크게 발전할 것 같다. 이게 포인트입니다. 이 거대한 시작이 있다. 이렇게 보고 있습니다. 내년에 이제 이 저자도 모시려고 지금 계속 접촉 중에 있습니다. 어, 오늘 프로그램입니다. 크게는 키노트가 있고요. 조금 뒤부터 이제 강의를 하실 텐데요. 그리고 바로 이어서 어, 엔터프라이즈 AI, 기업 AI, 비즈니스 AI 쪽하고 어, 테크놀리 쪽이 나누어져 있습니다. 이쪽은 이제 세션마다 원하시는 대로 선택해서 들으시면 되겠습니다. 
그리고 AI 서밋을 가장 잘 즐기는 방법입니다. 어제도 제가 쭉 들어보니까 어떤 주장이 어, 다 개인적이어서 좀 다른 주장도 있었는데요. 여러분들께서는 그분들이 아, 정답을 말하는구나 이렇게 생각하지 마시고 어, 본인의 경험과 본인의 이제 지식으로 어, 자기의 생각을 전달하는구나 이렇게 생각하시면 되겠습니다. 어제 이건 뭐 농담입니다만 그 저도 우연히 김재동 프로그램을 봤는데요. KBS에서 하더군요. KBS에서 어떻게 김재동이 나오나 싶어서 <웃음> 보고 있었는데 그 타이틀이 보니까 그건 네 생각이고 라고 되어 있더군요. 그래서 <웃음> 우리 강연자분들이 음, 주장하는 것은 뭐 제가 네 생각이라고 말하기는 힘들고 어, 이분이 어떤 자기의 커리어를 갖고 어, 저렇게 얘기하는구나 이렇게 어, 받아들이시고 거기에서 아, 나는 어떻게 해석하면 되겠구나 이렇게 하시는 게 제일 좋을 것 같습니다 어, 그리고 들어보시면서 아, 아마 오늘도 상당히 상반된 주장이 있을 겁니다 하나, 한, 하나는 우리는 갈 길이 멀다 실제로 뭐 프로젝트를 해보면 위에서는 하라고 하고 결과를 내라고 하지만 신문에서 나오는 그런 말도 안 되는 얘기는 말도 안 되는 거고 실제로는 어, 어, 같이 일할 실무자도 구하기 힘들다 시장에 사람이 있느냐 없다 그리고 맨날 그 전화 받고 돈더 주면 또 가버리지 않냐 <웃음> 지금 이 제가 이제 많은 인터뷰를 하다 보니까 그런 어려움을 호소하는 그 조직장들을 많이 만났습니다 심지어 저한테 사람 좀 구해달라 그래서 지금 데이터베이스 여러분들 데이터베이스를 다 갖고 있는데요 제가 연락하면 아 나를 딴데 옮기려고 하는구나 네, 그렇게 생각하시면 되겠습니다 농담이고 연락 안 드릴게요 어, 그래서 뭐 AI 쪽의 그 개발자 엔지니어는 뭐 정말 천정 부르는 게 값이라 할 정도로 천정부지라고 제가 들었습니다. 뭐 심지어 오늘 발표하는 발표하시는 조직장님한테서 들었고요. 그런 시점에 와 있습니다. 음, 그래서 또 하나의 주장은 아마도 AI가 크, 이게 과거와는 다른 큰 변화를 일으킬 것이고 어, 지금 그러고 있다는 것을 보여주는 분도 있을 겁니다. 그리고 이 양자를 다 접하시면서 어, 여러분들께서 판단을 하시면 좋을 것 같습니다. 네, 그러면 이제 시작해 볼 텐데요. 어, 먼저 시작하실 분은 그 PNG에 계셨, 27년간 계셨고, 잠깐만요, 슬라이드가 왜 넘어갔을까요? 아, 마지막 장을 띄워주세요. PNG에 어, 27년간 계셨고, 많은 경력 중에 마지막 그 하신 일이 디지털 트랜스포메이션 그 프로젝트를 총괄하셨어요. PNG에서. 그리고 지금은 이제 나오신 지 1년이 갓안 되시는 걸 알고 있습니다. 그래서 우연히 제가 이 정보를 접하고 서울에 좀 와달라 이렇게 부탁을 했고요. 이분이 이제 보시는 책이 내년에 나올 책입니다. Why Digital Transformation Fail? 왜 디지털 트랜스포메이션은 실패하는가? 라는 책을 본인의 경험을 통해서 적으신 거고 실패하지 않도록 그 요령을 어, 적으신 겁니다. 어, 이 책을 보여드리는 이유는 그 이분이 발, 강연하실 때 여러분들이 아 저분은 그 경험과 저 어, 저기에 대한 주제를 갖고 어, 이 강연을 하시겠구나 이제 이해를 하시면 편하시겠습니다. 그리고 어, 한국에서는 디지털 트랜스포메이션이라는 말을 많이 쓰지는 않습니다. 오히려 4차 산업이라는 말을 많이 쓰는데 실제로 이제 서구에서는 이 디지털 트랜스포메이션을 용어를 훨씬 더 많이 쓰고 있고요. 특히 비즈니스 쪽에서는 그렇습니다. 디지털 트랜스포메이션의 핵심은 사실 AI인데요. 그게 왜 AI인지를 이제 설명하실 거고 마지막으로 제가 이제 여러분들 강연에 참조하시도록 어, 이분께서 아마도 거기 GBS라는 용어를 쓰실 텐데 아웃소싱 서비스라는 용어도 쓰실 텐데요. 대기업에 이제 다니신 분들은 뭐 아시면 어, 제가 죄송합니다만은 이거는 이제 큰 기업들 옛날에 그큰 기업들은 사업부별로 HR이나 파이낸스나 IT가 막 지원을 많이 했었어요. 글로벌로. 그런데 P&G처럼 큰, 기업, 큰 기업은 수많은 제품을 다루는 기업 그리고 세계 100개 이상의 오피스를 갖고 있는 이 기업들은 그걸 통합 관리를 하기 시작했습니다. IT와 파이낸스와 HR을 중앙으로 통합해서 이거를 사업부를 지원하는 거예요. 그걸 GBS라고 부르는 거고 그러다 보니까 아웃소싱을 많이 하기도 하는데요. 그이 오퍼레이션을 얼마나 잘하느냐에 따라 회사의 경쟁력이 막 올라갑니다. 이 핵심의 이분이 있었어요. 그래서 이쪽에 이제 혹시나 이제 IT에 계신 분, 여기 이 자리에 오신 분들이 이 어깨에 계신 분들이라면 금, 금방 이분이 누군, 이분이 어떤 분인지 금방 눈치채실 거예요. 그 관점에서 한번 들어보셔 주시면 아마 포인트가 되지 않을까 싶습니다. 저는 30초 남았군요. 이제 내려가도록 하겠습니다. 
그러면 여러분들께 토니 어, 살단하 씨를 이 자리에 모시도록 하겠습니다. 뜨거운 박수로 맞이해 주시기 바랍니다. 굿모 o 닝 마이 네임 이즈 토니 살다나 and um, from the little korean that i could understand uh, john thank you very much for the introduction until recently i was vice president at uh, procter and gamble's global business services and it um, which uh, i think as john mentioned global business services is like the operations of the whole company so hr it finance And at P&G, which is a very large company, this is about two, two and a half billion dollars uh, annually. Um, it is fantastic to be back here in uh, Seoul. Um, I love this place. I have a lot of very good friends here. Uh, I absolutely love the food. Uh, I keep coming back for the food. Now, don't get me wrong. There are a lot of very good Korean restaurants in, uh, in, in the US, but if you want really good k a n j a n g g a j a n g You have to come here, right? So, um, thank you. Um, but unfortunately, um, I'm not here to talk about food. I'm, I'm here to talk about um, a story, a story of how at Procter and Gamble, we tried to reinvent ourselves, reinvent the operations of the company using AI, right? Um, and just in case, in the next few minutes, you get a very urgent call from your boss and says, you have to come back right now. I want to give you the summary of the whole talk in the next few minutes, okay? So there are three key messages that I'm going to share with you. Firstly, AI is urgent and AI is here. It is here today. Secondly, it is so powerful that each and every one of you here, and I don't care whether you are the CEO or the, the, the top government agent leader, or you are a new hire in your company, I don't care. Each one of you has the opportunity to be a hero if you do AI well. And the third message is that the trick is all about how and where to use AI. And that is the story that I'm going to share with you. And I'd like to start with the first of that key messages, which is AI is here, uh, with a quick video. Take a look at this. It's the world's smallest computer. Developed by the University of Michigan, the Micromote can fit on the edge of a nickel. Cubed, it's only one millimeter in size. Capable of taking pictures, reading temperatures, and recording pressure, the device is charged and programmed via light. Now, that was the world's smallest computer about three or four years ago. In my organization at P&G, uh, we had an, I, I led an organization which was called NGS, the Next Generation Services. We had the opportunity to work with IBM Labs on the latest version of that. The latest version is the thickness of a human hair, 0.1 millimeter. It is not an IoT device. It is a fully-fledged computer, input, processor, output. It has the power of the old IBM PCXT, PCAT. This shows you how old I am. Um, it, it, is, it has got that power. But best of all, it is going to be available for a few cents per computer. Now, if you are Procter & Gamble, and if you could get this computer dust, and if you could put one of these in every bottle of shampoo that you produce, how would that change your business? What could AI, what could algorithms do, all the way from supply to the consumer, right? That's what I mean. AI is here. This is not conceptual, it is here. The next story, um, the next message I shared with you is that it's all up to us to be heroes, right? So I mentioned Procter & Gamble's GBS is two, two and a half billion dollars. And the challenge, which is the story that I'm going to share with you, is how we went about 
disrupting. I'm not talking about a 10% improvement. I'm talking about a 10 times improvement of our current operations using AI, right? And the way we did this, this was my third message, is through a whole bunch of projects. Each of these is a 10x project. How do you do supply chain planning, not using SAP or MRP2 and other technologies, but how do you do it in real time from supply to demand? How do you do, what is the future of expense reporting? How do you actually create a Siri, iPhone-like Siri experience for your employees instead of the typical, you know, you go enter data and, you know, you go crazy using SAP, yeah? How do you use AI to run your warehouses? How do you have your IT infrastructure, servers, power, self-heal itself? How do you use call center artificial intelligence? How do you use AI in the stores? I won't go through all of those experiments. Later in the session, I will give you some more examples. But this is what we did at Procter & Gamble, right? This is the story that I'd like to share with you. And I'd like to start by actually quickly going through the agenda. Um, in the agenda, I'm going to run through, hopefully, one of these days, um, uh, four different things. Um, I'm going to share a little bit of the context. So what was the P&G business problem? What were we trying to do? The second, which I will share with you, is essentially what did we learn in this journey? The third, I will talk about those specific projects. And then finally, I want to leave you with a little bit of you know, lessons that I have learned, uh, along with the gray hair, um, you know, throughout this particular journey of AI. Um, because I feel like where exponential technology and AI is concerned, we are still children. We are simply learning what is possible, right? And we make a lot of mistakes. But just like you cannot avoid being a child if you want to be an adult, you have to play in this area now, right? And in case you were wondering, yes, that is a picture of mine from a very, very long time ago. Don't worry, this wasn't taken yesterday. Uh, it was taken many years ago when the Earth was still, you know, the dinosaurs roamed the Earth, and I had full black and curly hair. But somehow along the way, with Procter & Gamble, um, I, I seem to have lost um, uh, much of that curly black hair, but in turn, I got a wonderful experience working 27 years at Procter & Gamble. I had the opportunity with P&G to set up our first global shared services center in 1995 in the Philippines. I had the opportunity of outsourcing um, two-thirds of our IT and shared services organization to HP, which is a uh, $8 billion 10-year uh, deal. I had the opportunity of being CIO when P&G acquired the Gillette Razor Shaving Company in Boston. Um, and then for most of my career, I had the opportunity of running this you know, large operation in all of the regions of the world. And then about three years ago, I realized that I would have to undo all of the damage that I did over those last 24 years because the world was changing. And so what I ended up doing was essentially creating this next generation services, which I will talk about. Um, but all of this, I, I joke about you know, all, all of my hair and stuff like that, but in reality, it's been a fantastic experience working for uh, a wonderful company, Procter & Gamble. You guys are all familiar with Procter & Gamble. Uh, I'm sure you're familiar with the large size, um, so presence in 75 countries, uh, $67 billion in sales, uh, and the products. I, I am sure each one of you has you know, a room full of PNG products. If you don't, talk to me during the break, and I will see what I can do to help you. Um, but all of those products, including, I missed out SK2. SK2 is also one of our products, which I know is, is, um, is very popular here in Korea. Um, and within Procter & Gamble, I had the opportunity of, um, of uh, working uh, in um, global business services. And three years ago, as I said, after having run these operations, it became very clear that we had a problem. And it was an ironic problem. You see, Procter & Gamble's 
GBS, Global Business Services, was considered to be best in class in the world, right? Because we had things like one SAP platform for finance and supply chain and HR across the whole world, you know, fully standard. But the problem is, what do you do next after that? What happens when you have standardized? And this was an issue. So I went out and I talked to a hundred different companies, startups, venture capitalists, other companies, consultants. And through this process, I learned something important. I learned that although the consultancies said there is no next generation of GBS, that in the startups, there was a next generation of GBS, global business services. They do not do their internal operations like large organizations do, right? And those are some of the projects that came out of that. What I learned is that the real competition for internal operations in a company is not other large companies' internal operations. P&G's competition is not Unilever, right? It is not any of the local companies that you might have in China or Korea or Japan. P&G's real competition today is the startup, right? And therefore, my real competition in shared services had to be the startup. We had to figure out how it is that those organizations work and we had to change the way we work. And so, what I'm going to do is, I'm going to ask for your forgiveness as I step back a little bit and tell you what I learned from those hundreds of conversations that I had, right? Firstly, I know you're all familiar with Moore's Law, but I want to share something with you. If you look at that curve, you see that in 2023, so in a few years, five years from now, you will be able to buy for 1,000 US dollars the computing capacity of a human brain. Imagine that, what that can do to your workforce if you can buy a human brain for $1,000. But that's not it. 20 years after that, you will be able to buy for $1,000, the computing capacity of all humans on Earth. What could you do with that kind of capacity? I happen to be on MIT's task force of uh, workforce of the future. And I promise you, the workforce of the future does not look anything like the workforce of today. Right? It is all driven by this. The other thing I learned is that our leaders, government leaders, business leaders, CEOs, they are, of course, aware of digital disruption. This is an interesting study by McKinsey, the consultancy. What it says is that companies that have a digital strategy deliver 7% and 11% top line and bottom line results better than companies that don't. I want to repeat, they don't say anything about that digital strategy being a good strategy. If you have a digital strategy, your company does better than its peers. This is why I say you can all be heroes. It is not whether you are a master, it is whether you have the mindset to do something differently. Right? This is what it tells you. This is what I learned from my conversations. I also learned that there is a dark cloud. If 40% of the Fortune 500 companies will not exist in 10 years, this is urgent. This is something that we have to do uh, something about. We, everybody, needs digital disruption. This is not a choice. We need it. And by the way, that disruption is no longer about blue-collar jobs, mechanics, you know, people that work with their hands. This is about office worker, white-collar jobs. So, in the work that I did at P&G, I worked with um, a startup company on a software which had the ability to ingest, to digest contracts between companies. So, 
thousand pages of contracts and redline and mark up automatically which were the parts of the contract that were out of compliance of PNG policies. Further, it had, the, it had the capability to say, if you want to negotiate, these are the other five things that you can give, that you can negotiate. Think about it. We all thought that lawyer jobs were safe. My sister's a lawyer. I went back home and gave her a call. I said, your job is gone, forget it. You, know? you should have become an IT person. By the way, it's not just legal jobs. If you read online news updates, sometimes with yahoo.com in the US, I'm sure it's similar here in, in, in Korea, you get these, you know, one small paragraph of updates. Here is the latest sports news, or here's what's happening to the stock price. 90% of them are written by robots. Okay? We thought writing articles was a human job. Not any longer. Yeah. By the way, this is, um, sorry, this is not just a white collar issue. Schroeder creates nanoparticles, each marked by a unique barcode that carries a specific medication. These nanoparticles are then injected into the blood and enter the malignant tissue, penetrating through micro fissures that do not exist in healthy tissue. The nanoparticles then discharge the drug within the tumor cells. Normal, so this is a nanotechnology combined with AI use case in Israel. So they use um, these, these nanoparticles to target very specific cells. Otherwise, cancer medication is, is really bad because it destroys healthy cells as well. There's a next version of this that I saw from the University of California. Um, they have programmed nanobots that they can inject to actually do surgery in your body. They program each of those bots to go to very specific locations, like GPS locations in your body, and basically cut out those cells and then dissolve them. This is what AI can do when combined with other fields, right? And this is urgent. This is here. I want to share with you a tweet from my city of Cincinnati. Now, if you haven't heard about the city of Cincinnati, that's okay. Not many people in the world may be aware of its existence. It is not London, it's not New York, it is not Seoul. But here is a tweet that says, from the police department, that says, you know, there was a shooting in a certain area of the city. Um, the victim lied about it until the victim was given evidence on ShotSpotter. ShotSpotter is an AI technology that uses sound from within the city to accurately locate within 10 square meters in real time whenever a shot is fired in the city. It is used in London, it is used in New York, and who knew it's used in Cincinnati? Right? Cincinnati! Cincinnati is the place where Mark Twain, the famous poet and, and author, he said when the world <laughs> And I want to be in Cincinnati, because Cincinnati is always 10 years behind the times. That uses shot spotter. This stuff is all around us. It's crazy. But then the question I had to ask myself after I did all of these 100 interviews, is, is this one of those IT things that's always available in the next release? You know, you pay a million dollars, you'll get it into the next release, right? And I was asking myself that question until this happened. So this is an email exchange between me and a guy named A.J. Brustein, who was the CEO of one of these 100 companies that I was talking to. And I wanted to have a phone conversation with him, and we were exchanging emails on, hey, you know, when can you meet? He said, you know, how about this date? I said, no, I'm not available, maybe, you know, I'm not available next week, you know, how about the week after that? And he says, fine, I will ask Amy, who I assumed was his admin assistant, to set this up. And so Amy, at the bottom of the slide, you can see Amy basically sends a response saying, happy to do this, you know, how about all of these, which is a very, very boring email exchange until you double click on the bottom left hand, x.ai, Amy is a robot. This was in nine, 2015, 
in April. Amy had the ability to write perfect English and to fool all of us. Amy, the AI robot, could understand what we were saying. Because when I said on April 10th that I'm not available next week, you can see that none of her options for meeting were from the next week. She knew I was not there. She knew, he knew, who knew? I mean, I don't even know what to call him, right? This was 2015. So the question is, if AI is here, if it is all around us, how do we take the power of AI? How can we be heroes? And these were some of the examples that I was sharing with you earlier on. So I'm going to, I'm going to um, dive a little bit into some of these specific examples. We won't have time to go through all of those. Um, but I want to start with my famous example, which is not a very, very big savings to the company, but it's an example which I'm sure everybody can relate with, right? You all do business travel. You all do expense reports, right? Of course, you all love doing expense reports, right? I'm joking, you don't, right? But what happens in large companies or in any company? You go on a trip, you book your ticket through a travel agency, right? You have to go through them because they have negotiated good rates with hotels and airlines. You do your business trip, you collect receipts, you make an expense report. Somewhere in your organization, maybe in Costa Rica or India or Manila, somebody matches your receipts with your expense report, and then you get the money. What happens in Adobe or Netflix or Google? If you want to make a trip from Seoul to New York, you go into the system and say, I need to make a trip for one week. And the system says, OK, thank you very much. Your budget is the equivalent of whatever, $10,000. At that point in time, you are free. You can book online wherever you want. You can stay in whatever hotel you want. Or you can stay with Airbnb or your friends. If you use less than the budget, let's say 10000 the remaining money, based on the company policy, you can either gain share, you can take some of that, the company will give you some of that money, or you can donate it to charity, or the next time you go to New York, you can stay at the Ritz Hotel. But best of all, and I know this is going to be very disappointing to you because you love making expense reports, you do not have to make expense reports. Think about that. As long as you use the company credit card, the data is already there, right? Procter & Gamble spends about $400 million a year on travel. In some of the tests that we did, not only were the employees delighted because they didn't have to make an expense report, but the average spending in the company went down 15 to 30 percent by freeing up the people. This is what AI can do for you, right? I want to share with you a few more examples. Um, accounts receivables. Now, I know some of these operational examples are not very sexy, right? I mean, as accounting. Um, so, in most organizations, the accounting department, the accounts receivables department, has to deal with what happens when you expected your customer to pay you some money and you don't get that, right? It's a process which is called disputes or claims. In PNG, we have about 400 people across the world that deal with AR, accounts receivables, mostly with disputes. And this is the way it works, right? So let's say, you know, PNG. Um, sells in the U.S. a thousand U.S. dollars to Walmart, but then Walmart ends up paying only nine hundred dollars. So what happens in these companies is you have the accounts receivables organization of P&G, then negotiating with the accounts payables organization of Walmart to say, oh, what happened here? 
But here's the thing. This is all a data issue. Because the data of what happened is somewhere. It is either at P&G or at Walmart or the bank or the transportation company. And so we created algorithms, AI-based algorithms, that could tell with more accuracy than a human what happened. And so today, this is used in two regions across the world um, instead of being a manual activity, right? Let me give you one other example. Call centers. Now, most, um, most companies that create products basically have a contact phone number or email behind each product, right? Now, if you happen to be a call center agent that is handling the call or the emails, and P&G has 800 of them across the world, your life is not easy. Because one minute you get a question saying, oh, my pampers, my, my baby's diaper is leaking, what should I do? And the next caller says, hey, in your Pantene shampoo, can you tell me if this, if this um, chemical, diethylene dioxide, whether it is sourced sustainably from Indonesia? It's like, who knows, right? So the life of these call center agents is not easy. So here's what we did. We came out with two AI tools. One that did, very simply, voice-to-text translation. So, and, it, and, and by the way, this was uh, multilingual, so because I like to do things a little differently, I'm, I'm a little crazy, I actually tested this in China. So Chinese to English, in real time. Secondly, you take that text, and then you go against PNG's databases, and then you come out with the right answer, or the best answer for the agent. And, and, and if you get that contact, not on the phone, but on email, the second AI had the ability to actually write the email. But we did not want machines from PNG to talk to consumers, so we already always had a human to do the final touch. Um, but this is what's possible. This is what's possible. Let's take another example. I talked about um, a Siri-like experience um, for your employees, right? Now, we all have smartphones, um, and the smartphone experience, whether it is you know, Siri or you know, whatever your um, virtual assistant of choice, is very different from what you have in your company or your government agency. If you are driving on one of the highways and you say, hey, I'm hungry, Siri, what is the nearest Mediterranean restaurant here? The technology, AI, has the ability to look across different systems. The GPS systems tell you its location. The, the restaurant databases tells it, you know, where are the restaurants. Uh, text translation translates between Mediterranean being, you know, Greek or, you know, any of the Italian or, you know, any of the other cuisines, right? It is all handled by this layer in between. However, if you are working in a company, and you have a new hire, a new person joining your company, I promise you, you probably have to go to like four or five different systems. One to get security access, another for payroll, you know, another one to get a new PC or a phone, and, you know, so on and so forth. Why can't you have the same Siri-like experience in the corporate enterprise? So that's exactly what we did. We created a bot that would go talk to each of those back-end systems because you don't want to change all of your back-end systems, right? And what it did was give you the ability to just say something as simple as, hey, I have a new hire named ABC joining such and such a date. You know, can you just organize everything, right? In today's world, millennials expect a different level of systems, ease of use, than what old people like me were okay with, right? So we have to give it to them. 
The final example I want to share with you is um, how we used blockchain for transportation management for ocean shipping, right? So you may be aware that IBM and the ocean shipping company Maersk have created a blockchain joint venture, and what they do is basically they take all of the transactions of shipping, whether it is the contract or you know, what is the customs cost or what is the penalty because your goods were delayed in the port, or you know, what is the cost of transportation and air shipping, and they put it all on one blockchain, which is very nice. But when they came to me, I said, yeah, but this is not 10x enough. Um, I want to make this even bigger. So I challenged them, and we partnered to do this. I said, if I have all of the information, if you're shipping from a supplier in Korea to a destination, let's say in Cincinnati, and I know the original contract cost, and I can know from the blockchain how much did we pay customs, how much did we pay you know, freight forwarders, how much did we pay every entity, then why should I ever want to get an invoice? Why don't we just get rid of the invoice process? No invoice document, no rework at PNG or any of the suppliers. So that's what we did. And we're running this test in about five or six different shipping lanes uh, with these companies. Right? So this is, these are the kind of examples of what AI can help you do. And, and I could go on for the next two hours, which I won't, so please relax. Um, but what I want to do is, is I, want to, I want to give you the secret sauce of why this is possible. I talked about my third key message being you have to know when and how to use AI. This is the magic slide. AI, or any other exponential technology by itself, is only one-third of the answer. In the example of travel and expenses, or the blockchain shipping. I could have just replaced the existing technology with a new technology, and I would have gotten maybe a 20% improvement. But I added one more piece, work process. So instead of saying, what is the travel and expense process and how do I improve that, I said, why do you need the travel and expenses process? Right? That's what gives you another big advantage. The third advantage is ecosystems. So information that goes outside of your organization. So um, with the accounts receivables, instead of saying we will just deal with our own information, we said, well, if we get information from our customers, that makes the whole, the whole solution much more powerful. So here is the magic. You have to put together not just AI, but you also have to look at work process, and you also have to look at information and capabilities across ecosystems. If you think about it, that's what Airbnb did, right? While most of the hotel chains were automating their processes, they were replacing their financial or accounting process, or they were making check-in kiosks where consumers could you know, check in, Airbnb said, why do I need a check-in process? Why do I need a restaurant? Why do I need, why do I need a hotel room? Right? You have to combine two or more of these slices to get a 10x disruption. Right? So, um, with that, as I said, I wanted to kind of end with my learnings. What, what, have, what have I learned over the last several years? Um, Let's start with Google's this. Google's latest artificial intelligence, AlphaZero, has defeated one of the best chess programs in the world after learning the game from scratch in just four hours. The superhuman AlphaZero AI played 100 games against rival computer program Stockfish 8 and won or drew all of them. 
Here's the, remember when I started, I said there are three key messages. One of the message was AI is already here. And by the way, AI's capability continues to grow exponentially. So you're all familiar, I'm sure, with the AlphaGo and, and, the, um, uh, and, and, and the game uh, that uh, Google's uh, DeepMind computer played with it. What you may not know is the first version of DeepMind was trained over many, many years with many, many human cases. The second version, humans did not train it. The computer taught itself. What it did was it basically played simulated games against, um, uh, against a computer, and then it was told whether you win or you did not win. And in four hours, it taught itself better than any humans could teach it over many, many years. Right? That's what I mean by exponential capability. That's what's happening to AI. This was the first thing that I learned. Right? The next thing that I learned was you have to do something about it. And by the way, something means you have to disrupt yourself in your day-to-day -day operations. You have to disrupt yourselves in your improvement projects, and you have to disrupt yourselves in a 10x way, and you have to do all three things in parallel. When I work with large organizations, they say, you know, all of these stories are fine, but I have a business to run, right? I cannot stop my business. And my answer to them is, this is what I learned from Google, the rule of 70-20-10. In any organization, 70% of your capacity should be on running your operations. 20% should be on continuous improvement, and 10% should be how to disrupt yourself. By the way, those percentages don't mean anything at PNG. I didn't spend 10% on, on, of my capacity on this work. It was probably even less than 1%, right? But you have to do all three things. You cannot say, I have to run a business. I cannot destabilize myself. That's wrong. You have no choice. You have to do all three things. That was the second thing I learned. The final thing that I learned was the biggest challenge you will have is not AI, is not your systems. The biggest challenge you will have is your organization. Martech's law basically says your organization change on a logarithmic or you know, somewhat flat rate. Technology changes at an exponential rate. The difference between those two lines becomes bigger over time. Your job as a leader is to come up with a plan that keeps those differences manageable. That is your biggest issue. That's what you need to do. And by the way, it can be done, right? Because if Amy, the robot, could do calendaring, right? If PNG, the experiments that we did, could get rid of expense reports, or if in Dubai you can have robots that do camel racing, there's nothing that you, each one of you in this room, cannot do. What you have to remember is that this issue is real. It is here. That it is big. You have the opportunity to be heroes. And you have to teach yourself to start now. And you have to teach yourself on where to apply AI. You will make mistakes. You have to make mistakes. You are still a child. But you will learn. And you will learn very quickly. But if Amy the robot can do calendaring and robots can do camel racing in Dubai, yes, you're wondering, what is this camel racing thing? So let me show you what it is. 
Camel racing is an ancient tradition in the Arab world, but mechanical jockeys used today have only been around for a decade or so. The jockeys weigh about six and a half pounds. They come equipped with a walkie-talkie so the camel can take directions, and a small whip, which is activated by a remote control. There you go. That's what you can do. Thank you very much.